Welcome to another edition of Grace Under Pressure, where my guest today is Richard Schell. Uh, Grace Under Pressure is a LinkedIn live show. We pose questions to thought leaders and doers like Richard, who is a professor at Wharton, and I'll tell you all about him. Um, and when we talk about Grace Under Pressure, it's that ability to bring people together for common cause, do it with a generous heart, respect for others, and compassion. And also leaders filled with grace are energetic for the goodness of all of us. So welcome, Richard. It's an honor to have you on our show today. So, John, I really, really appreciate your having me. My pleasure. Great. Uh, Richard, you are the, the um, professor, excuse me, the Thomas Garrity Professor of Legal Studies, Business Ethics and Management at the Wharton School. And you've been teaching there for uh, many years and you're also the chair of that department. Uh, you are the author of uh, several books, including Bargaining for Advantage, uh, The Art of Woo, which I remember that one, um, and your newest book, which we're gonna focus on today, The Conscience Code, Lead With Your Values to Advance Your Career. Um, so it's up, and you've also uh, a prolific consultant. And I work for uh, the big name companies from companies you might have heard of, like J and J, Google, and the crisis negotiation of FBI. That's pretty cool. So anyway, and your uh, articles have been uh, published in New York Times and the Wall Street Journal. Uh, welcome, Richard. It's an honor to have you on the show, sir. So thanks. I'm looking forward to our conversation. Great. Let's begin with character, which is fundamental to our conscience. So um, how do you define it? Uh, well, you know, I think character, um, it's an interesting word because until about 1930, people didn't talk about personality. They talked about character. Mm -hmm. And uh, psychologists studied character the way psychologists study personality now. So there was a, a period of time when the word character stopped having its classic meaning of having to do with virtue and began having a kind of generic meaning of having to do with uh, you know, he's a quirky character. <laughs> and uh, but then the psychologists got embarrassed because there was a moral <laughs> overtone to character. And so they they abolished the word character from psychology and oh. now and called it personality. Sure. So I define character in the sense of the conscience code in this book. And when we talk about ethics and morality as the habit, and I believe character traits are habits um, of favoring the social good over your self-interest. Right. Uh, when, when these two things come into conflict, someone who we speak of as having character is someone who overcomes the impulse towards self-interest and is able to be generous and self-sacrificing really in favoring the public good, the, the social good. Great. Now, you and I are of, of that same, uh, this generation, and you have a moment of crisis early as a young man. I mean, you uh, had a moment of conscience, a son of a decorated general, and you were opposed to the war in Vietnam. So tell us about that moment of conscience, Richard. Sure. Yeah. And, and that's, a, that's a, a very important part of my personal journey and also motivates um, a number of things, including this book. Um, so I was raised in a military family. My dad, as you mentioned, was a general. He was in the United States Marine Corps, a decorated World War II veteran. Uh, my mother's father was in the Army. My father's father uh, was in the Navy. There was a military tradition. My sister married a naval officer. So there was no doubt when I was growing up whether I was going to go in the military. The only question was whether I'd go to West Point or Annapolis. Uh, now, I got a dispensation and was able to uh, persuade my parents to let me go on a Navy scholarship to another university. So I ended up going to, to college, uh, but it was on a Navy uh, full ride, and I still had an obligation, as I would have had I gone to the academies. Sure. The problem was that in the middle of my college years, uh, the Vietnam War escalated to a very substantial degree. Uh, the social agreement about the justice and morality of that war shifted dramatically. And I was called for the first time in my life, really, to think about what it was I had signed up to do. Because up to that point, it was just everything, everybody around me just did that. That was the career. And, you know, they say the military is a family business, and I think it really is. Um, but I had this moment where I had to make a decision. Uh, was I going to continue on the path I was on, which would lead me to Vietnam, where I would 
doubtless be called upon to kill people I now realize I had no conflict with. Yeah. Or was I going to take a different path? And so after a lot of soul searching, I decided to become a war resistor and a conscientious objector. This caused a very substantial breach with my family, as you can imagine. Um, and uh, it was difficult and painful. And so that, that experience early in my life, I was in my you know, early 20s, mm -hmm. really, really uh, put me squarely in the camp of when you have a choice that involves your conscience, you really have to make the decision toward your values. Uh, even when the opposing value is as, as important as my, in my case, uh, loyalty to your family, um, your sense of right and wrong uh, is going to haunt you for the rest of your life if you don't make the right call. So I, you know, ultimately um, uh, ended up being a social worker in Washington, D.C., working with impoverished families in condemned buildings and doing something very other than being a military officer. Right. But that crisis did inform my career choices and my uh, um, and my interest in uh, this general area of uh, being a person of conscience, as I felt I was in those in that crisis, but being a person of conscience as an identity, uh, something you bring to a leadership role, something you bring to a professional role, and it's underlining and and uh, sh and sort of uh, highlighting everything about the choices you make, whatever the role is. Great. You, you, um, and thank you. That's what's such an, um, a powerful story. I mean, as a young man, you faced uh, a moment of reckoning and you made a hard choice that was doubly hard, I would think, uh, at least that because of your military tradition. So Absolutely. That was, I could see it would be perceived by some in your family as a rejection of them, which of course it was not, but uh, human nature being what it is. So um, anyway, so you have some now moving to where we are now. You talk about bringing your personal conscience goes to work. What does that mean? So, well, I think, uh, you know, one of the things about this field, and I'm the, as you mentioned, the chair of, well, until today, I was the chair of the Legal Studies and Business Ethics Department. I rotated out of that job uh, this morning. So, oh. but the. Uh, <laughs> well, okay, we're wrong already. <laughs> no, it, it, and I'm, I couldn't be more delighted to give it to somebody who's going to take it on now. But the, um, but I think that the, 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 the notion is that um, we have, a, all of us are people of conscience. Uh, we have our conscience at work. We have our conscience at home. But sometimes people make a line and they, they, they feel these values as really important priorities at home with their families, uh, in their spiritual communities, um, in, the, uh, in their work within their community in school districts or whatever. But then there's, there's something that happens during the commute, you know, between uh, home and work where there's sort of a different set of values that you have to adopt when you get to work. Uh, just to survive. And my, my view is that that's wrong. Yeah. That if, um, if you're a person of conscience in one part of your life, you should be a person of conscience in all parts of your life. The, 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 the hard part is how to be a person of conscience at work. Uh, and that's a different question than whether to be. And so when I say bring your conscience to work, I mean, be the same person in terms of your values at work as you are in the other parts of your life. Okay. I mean, if, you were a par if you're a parent and you value your, your role as a parent and you were in the grocery store and you know, some survey person came up and said, I wanna, you know, you're with your three-year-old child and your, the survey person says, would you come over to this table and fill out my little survey on you know, the XYZ? And you go, well, I've got this three-year-old child. And they say, oh, you can just leave in the aisle. It's okay, uh, they'll be safe. <laughs> I think you probably wouldn't even have much of a moment where you'd say, are you crazy? I'm not going to leave my three-year-old child. Yeah. And the same thing at work when someone says, uh, will you falsify this report? Uh, it's just a piece of paper. It's just backdating something that we forgot to fill out. Uh, if your values are front and center, it's not a hard call. What would a person of conscience do? Would they lie on a piece of paper about being at work on a day they weren't there? No. Now the question is, okay, I know what I have to do. What's the best way to do it? that protects my relationship with the person asking me, that protects my career and my job, that solves the problem, whatever it might be. And that's what the conscience code is about. It's, I'm assuming the people who read it are good people, but they're under pressures that can put them in very difficult places. And I'm trying to help people figure out how to navigate to the right answers 
uh, in a very strategic, methodical, systematic way. Great. And and thanks. Now, before we jump in totally on that, I want to say I've had a, a few guests on the show. Some are military folks. Uh, um, we talk about resilience and resilience. I like to think is, is like a muscle. The more you use it, it's stronger. Could you we say the same thing about conscience, Richard, that the more we use it, the stronger we get? Do you, as an analogy there? So. Yeah, I think that's absolutely the case. I think um, Aristotle uh, said that virtue is a practice. It's not a state of being. Uh, and arete, which is excellence in the context of Aristotle's ethics, is excellence in practice. And uh, I think that the conscience uh, that we have is only, it, it's a signal. It tells you what your values are and when you think they're being violated. But your values don't have a life unless you um, live them. Uh, and so, you know, I like, you know, you basically uh, when, when these decisions come, it's really the universe is asking you, what's the price you're willing to pay to have your values? And yeah. if, if the price is, I'm really not willing to pay any price for my values, I, I give them up all the time, yeah. <laughs> then, uh, then, you're, then you're in trouble. And if you, you know, the little times when your values are challenged, the price you are asked to pay is very little. But it makes you stronger when you acquire the habit of virtue in responding to little moments. That makes it easier for you to know the right answer and to have a habitual response when the stakes are higher. And, uh, and, and often, you know, life doesn't come with labels. So what you perceive to be a little moment might actually be a, a pivotal moment in the life of the company you work for or in your own career and making the right call is if it's a habit, you don't have to worry about it. Right. Right. And you know, it's fascinating. And what I like about your work and we'll delve into it. Do you have a copy of conscious code with you? I uh, do. The, the Carry with it me all the time. Right. <laughs> all right. Great. So, um, I know you teach this, these principles in school and you touch and, and at Wharton, and you touched on this several times, and it's the the how. So, why did you write it? Well, I, it's very uh, very good question. I I teach a course called Responsibility in Business. One of the courses I teach negotiation, I teach persuasion, but a required course at Wharton is a course called Responsibility in Business. And uh, one of the exercises I have them do is write about, and this is a class of 50 or 60, uh, write about an example of a moment in your past where you were called to uh, make a value judgment and to act according to your principles, and, uh, and you stood up and, uh, and were counted. And then another example where you now realize you fell short. And you could have done better. So everybody's a saint and a sinner on a given day. And so everybody has both stories. But what I was recognizing was many of the students uh, were telling stories of both kinds, which ended with the following uh, coda. Um, and so I quit my job and started applying to business school. And, and I went, whoa, wait a minute. Uh, you know, uh, and, and I began inquiring about why that was the result. And mostly it was the result of 20-somethings who found themselves being bullied or in a toxic work environment or asked to do something they knew to be immoral. And they, uh, they couldn't stomach it. And so they looked for a pivot and business school looked like an option for them at that time in their life. But one student who would had uh, a client put their hands on her knee under a dining room table at a restaurant for a client dinner and had resisted and done about three or four different things to get distance uh, and finally, you know, successfully changed seats at the table. She finished her story and, and, and exited this industry that she was in. She finished her story and said, you know, I'd never had any doubt about the value that I was, uh, you know, that I, I felt insulted and, and uh, that I was being assaulted, but I, I really didn't know what to do about it. And uh, the guy was an important client. I felt that if I had reported it to my boss, he probably would have just shrugged his shoulders. Uh, and, you know, so, so leaving seemed to be the, the salient option. So I thought to myself, you know, we can, I could help this person because I teach negotiation, persuasion, organizational politics. You know, all this stuff is what I've been doing for 30 years. Yeah. But it, it needs to be applied in this very fraught, very difficult kind of environment where value conflicts are coming up. 
And so the book really was inspired by the, the student comment. I didn't know what to do about it. So, because no, you know, you're not going to, you know, first of all, business school is an incredibly expensive way to quit a job. Uh, and, <laughs> oh, yeah. uh, and, you, and you're only going to get one time to do that. Yeah. So all these people are going to graduate. They're going to have to have a better solution next time. And, and, and think of themselves as leaders, which is your sweet spot. And think of themselves as people of conscience as well as leaders. Now you're motivated to come with a, with a playbook to okay. manage these difficulties. Well, you said something before we came on I thought was fascinating, especially coming from a person of higher, very higher education. And when we <laughs> talked about care or conscience, you said, um, tell me what you said about when we learn our conscience or character. Well, yeah, I, I'm a, I, I come from the school that everything you needed about your conscience, you learned in kindergarten. Uh, <laughs> And so, you know, it's your family, it's the upbringing you've had, it's a spiritual community you may have been raised in, and your sense of right and wrong, unless you're a psychopath, and we're <laughs> going to rule them out from our, uh, they, they won't read my book, and they won't watch your podcast. So, uh, uh, but the, um, but, but I think what we do when we get to people who are adults, and we're talking about things like business ethics, is People turn off because they go, well, wait a minute. I already know what's right and wrong. Here comes these people trying to tell me what, you know, what, you know, how to be a good person, you know, what's ethical. Um, and so I'm a, I'm a big believer that it isn't about telling people that they're bad and they ought to get better. It's about reminding them of who they are and then helping them integrate the best of who they are with the professional role that they are occupying, whether that role is as a nurse or as a lawyer, or as a business leader, uh, a political person, uh, and bring it all, integrate themselves, and make their identity something that is coherent, that gives them fulfillment, and that leaves them with no regrets. It leaves them with a sense of pride that they have weathered the storm and done the best they could. Now, you know, no set of tools, no set of, of uh, uh, rules is going to result in success every time. But I think when you leave it on the field uh, and you tried your best, then you don't have the sense of remorse you do when you duck and look for cover and turn the other way. Right. And I think what's valuable about, about your work and the framing of it is something that you uh, I read in the description of it. It's a way to navigate. And again, it gets back to the how. It's yes. If you ask pe people, are you a good person? We're probably all going to say, well, yeah, I'm not perfect, but I'm good. I And so when it comes to conscience, do you have a conscience? Well, yeah, I do. So but you're you're translating it to a practice. So Tell us how we put these into practice, some, some sure. hows, if you will, Richard. Sure, sure, absolutely. I mean, the book is really structured around a four-step process. Mm -hmm. And it, but it, but you know, each step has some depth to it. And, um, you know, after writing the book, I actually came across a, an acronym that I find quite useful and it's striking. Uh, it's called the ODA loop. Uh, oh, you may yeah. have heard of it, the ODA oh, loop. Oh, yeah, I know it well. No. O-O-D-A loop, and it's a combat pilot tactical uh, uh, program for managing aerial combat. And in that, it's the, the, the letters stand for uh, observe, orient, decide, act. Observe, orient, decide, act. And then loop means watch what they do, and then you start over again the loop. Uh, and now in, in the way I think about it in the context of moral and ethical and value conflicts, the first step is, is actually harder than it sounds. You have to turn and face the issue and observe that there's something going on in front of you that does prick your conscience. There, there's a reason why that there's that uneasiness that maybe there's something wrong here. And, and so the first gate is you have to face the conflict instead of turn away from it. So that's the observe part. The second step is, now that you've observed it, instead of orient, which is the pilot way, I say own it. So owning the conflict means you're going to take responsibility. It doesn't mean you're going to be the hero of the story. It just means this is going to be something you have to take action on. And I think the ownership place in this process is the hardest in many ways. Because it's where you decide whether to own the conflict or not, that all the rationalizations typically flood our brains when we're about to create trouble for ourselves, mm -hmm. uh, comes flying in where, oh, no one will notice. It's not my responsibility. It's just a little thing. 
Uh, you know, maybe it'll go away by itself. Maybe I'm misperceiving what's happening. Uh, it, you know, I don't want to have uh, my career at risk. You know, all the different things that come in that make you want to not own it. And against that, what I advise in the book is have a few counter narratives in your head. And uh, one of them is what would a person of conscience do? And that immediately evokes a pretty simple answer. And, and, and you'll know the answer to that without having to think too hard. Uh, another one is, who's the person you most admire as a person of conscience? It could be your grandmother. It could be a mentor. And ask, well, in this situation, what would they do? Uh, and so, so now, instead of just being ruled by rationalizations, you're using judgment about owning the conflict. So that's step two. Step three is decide. And this is traditional strategic thinking. At this point, you have to observe what the options are that are feasible and make a decision on the most uh, sort of cost effective, least risky, most, you know, sort of uh, possible to advance the ball option. And that may be in a values conflict, something as simple as contacting your mentor and saying, I've got this issue. Uh, I want to do something about it, but I don't quite know what the best answer is in this political environment that we have in our company. Could you advise me? Uh, it could be you have lunch with one of your colleagues in the next cubicle and you say, have you noticed that the team leader is, uh, you know, hitting on the intern? Uh, and they go, yeah, now there's two of you. And now you're in a stronger position to kind of gain some confidence and momentum to go to what's the next step. Uh, but even talking to that person in the next cubicle is a, f is a full Oda loop in my view. So you've surveyed the options, you took action, you talked to them, and now you're going to learn something and the loop goes back to, okay, what do we do next? So I think when you've got that Oda loop running, instead of how do I get out of here and how do I escape and how do I hide, uh, you're on a much more constructive path. I think you've touched it. Thank you. It's, uh, I, I've never heard the Oda loop apl uh, applied to conscience. So brilliant. I love it. But here's something that, it, it, that popped out at me and it resonates with conscience. And I always think of conscience as my character. You, you have it or you don't. But I think of it as personal and private. You uh, wove in the concept of consultative. If, you, if you're in this dilemma, talk to a colleague talk to a mentor. I like that. It, it gives us a little breathing room. Does it not, Richard? Oh, I think I, on all these narratives I've, you know, heard of my students, these millennials, soon to be Gen Zers sitting in my classrooms, by far the most common characteristic of the failure stories is that they did it alone. They felt isolated. They were uncertain. They lacked confidence. They were uh, they felt that they were the only one that had this perception. Um, uh, they were scared. Uh, and so the first step, I, you know, I have a chapter in the book called The Power of Two. And the first step has to be get it outside yourself. Um, you know, there's a wonderful new book called The Extended Brain that just mm -hmm. came out. It was is reviewed a lot recently. And, you know, it's, a, it's an obvious point. They make it in a nice psychological way. But, you know, we all have our own brains. But actually, the human species is a collective and uh, the real power in our science and on our ability to create organizations and solve problems is when the brains get together yes. and uh and when a when a when you face a moral or an ethical conflict the first step needs to be get outside your brain and share it with another one so that you can get perspective and they may have good advice and they may have someone else that they want to bring into the conversation. Uh, and, you know, that just, just amplifies the chance that you're going to have a successful outcome by an exponential rate. I want to touch on something which is in getting, getting into the world of grace in a sense, but you are an expert in this because you've got a unique perspective because of the quote failure stories you've had. So what advice do you give them? What about self-forgiveness? Do you oh, talk yeah. about that? So how, yeah. how does that surface, Richard? Yeah, no, it, it comes up all the time. Uh, and, but I have to say, not many people pick up on it as you just did. I think, um, you know, first of all, the That's way- That's I'm always screwing up, Richard. <laughs> we all are. We're all sinners. But the, uh, I, I try to encourage the students to tell these stories. And you got to remember, they're sitting in a classroom in front of 60 
hyper achievers, all <laughs> bored and MBA students. Yeah. And I'm asking them to tell a story about some moment when they had a moral failure. Uh, and and this is this is not easy to do in terms of creating a, a trusting, vulnerable environment in which they're willing to do this. Here's what I try to do. I try to tell them two things. Number one, um, if you had a success, build on it. So as we said earlier, virtue is a practice. When you successfully manage a difficult uh, moment, uh, it's going to make you stronger, more confident. You'll build a better habit for the next one. Secondly, when you fall short, these are the teachers. These are the, t the teachers for you. You learn uh, from times when you fell short, and everybody is going to fall short. There's absolutely no doubt about whether it's just when. And if you have one of these moments where you turn the other way, I'll give you a story. I'll give you an example uh, of a redemption story, really. And that's what these come to. It was a woman in the class. And when I gave her this assignment, she came up with her failure story uh, as a moment when she was younger. Uh, and she was actually in college. She was from an evangelical family. And they belonged to an evangelical church. And she had a very close friend who was a guy, a young man of her own age, who was gay. And the church disproved of homosexuality right. to such an extent that uh, when they discovered that he was gay, they banished him from the community. And um, she felt at the time, she said, uh, she felt this tremendous conflict between her loyalty to her spiritual community and her family, which was deeply committed to this evangelical community on the one hand, and her compassion and her friendship and her loyalty to her friend. And she chose her family and she had regretted it ever since. And what she had done with that memory of a failure in her mind was to use it as motivation to be an active ally of the LGBT community, uh, to uh, find ways to be supportive and to be leaders with them in the, the fight they have for rights and justice. And so she had actually channeled that moment when she let herself down into a professional commitment to being uh, effective on behalf of that community. She couldn't go back and fix the moment. No. Uh, but she could repair it by keeping it top of mind as a social and a values priority. So I think these these moments when we don't uh, step up to, in a way on reflection we wish we could have can fuel our motivation to redeem that and uh, and to make it right and make it good by living that value in a way that uh, we missed at the time. I love that story. And, you know, it, it resonates with me in the sense that um, because so often we make career choices uh, and they, they may come out of a failure. Um, and we said, I was wrong here and I'm going to make this turn and I'm not perfect, but I'm going in this line. And what a wonderful and noble, I will say, act of grace that this young woman. Absolutely. In her life. So, no, I feel the very same way about it. And I think, I think that um, I, I talk in the book about moral emotions and I think it's really important for people to recognize moral emotions for what they are. They're not just emotions that, you know, you're angry because it's raining. Uh, when you're angry in a moral sense, it's because you sense injustice. Righteous anger. And righteous anger, exactly. And righteous anger is a, is, a, is a virtue. Yes. Righteous anger is a way to motivate yourself to speak up and to take action and to be uh, persistent. Uh, the same is true for guilt and shame, both of which can be very toxic emotions. People who are racked with guilt and can't function because they can't get over it are in a clinical condition and it, it really makes it hard for them to get up in the morning. But right. anticipating that there's gonna be a values conflict or, in, or managing one when you're in the middle of it and ask yourself, how, who am I going to be if I make this decision this way? Who am I going to be if I make this decision that way? And when you look down one path and you see, I'm going to feel really guilty about not having done the right thing and realize that that feeling is not going to go away. That feeling is going to stay with you. And the cost of having that guilt with you, uh, there are only certain moments when you get to take action and anticipating the path of guilt and avoiding it 
by doing the right thing is a perfectly honorable motivation to right. do the right thing. It's basically your values motivating you to do it. And the our same is true. Right. Our conscience. Yeah, conscience right. is, the conscience yeah. is about guilt. I yeah. think that the, the shame ah. part is more complicated because shame is more a fear being judged. Yeah. Uh, and sometimes you can feel guilt and shame about the same thing. Sure. Uh, but sometimes shame is one where you're, uh, you're sort of worried that if you do it, I'll tell you another story, if that's okay. Uh, sure. I was I was talking to another uh, individual uh, a couple of days ago, and they told me a story about when they were a kid. And this story was actually a kind of success story, uh, but it shows you how far shame can help you. So he was a young man. He was like nine or 10 years old, and his family is from very, very modest means. And they were, um, when you know, whenever the local corner store had a sale on a Pop-Tart, uh, their dad would give him 99 cents to go down and buy a Pop-Tart. It's a big treat. Yeah. Um, well, the, the, the corner store, uh, for whatever reason, uh, didn't have a sale on Pop-Tarts on a given month. And so this guy went into the store and he really wanted a Pop-Tart and he, and he wasn't going to get one. So he took a 99 cent sticker from another product and put it on the Pop-Tart. And went up to the place to check out because sure. he had his 99 cents. And uh, the guy said, uh, well, wait a minute. This is not the right sticker. And the, uh, the kid said, oh, well, you know, he, boy, you know, he tried to finesse his way through it. Uh, but the store owner said, uh, you know, I don't think so, young man. And so he said he basically he ran out of the store. Sure. Now, um, what he was feeling was the possibility of shame. Mm -hmm. Because had he been reported to his father by this clerk that he had been doing this in a store, it would have been a very shameful moment for him and all the rest. He didn't get caught. I mean, yeah. he was protected from himself by this <laughs> store clerk. But, but, and here's the important part. He is now 50 years old. He still remembers that story. Mm -hmm. And it helps him keep himself honest when he's tempted to cut a corner and he can remember that, and he can remember how narrow the escape was, <laughs> and he can he can enjoin himself not to do stuff now because he's a grown up, and okay. remember that the shame he would have felt then is pretty much the worse now than it would have been then, and and so the 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 anticipation and avoidance of shame is a is a very powerful motive and a very honorable one. Well, that's great. We're coming to the end, but I want to put a button on this before I ask you one another sure. question because I think of conscience as uh, a moral choice. It's aspirational in it, but I like how you said, but it's governed, if my words, by a sense of guilt or yeah. perhaps shame, as you yeah. just told us. So that's that puts it back to the less aspirational and more, I better be on the straight and narrow because well, I, you know, I, I don't think it's either or. I think you can be motivated by a positive motivation to create sure. change, to, yeah. you know, for social justice, for all the good stuff. It's just that you don't be worried if the reason you're doing something is because you want to avoid guilt. That's just as good. I, you know, the um, Mies Peep was the uh, the Austrian woman who protected Anne Frank's family in Amsterdam during World War II and mm -hmm. protected them from the Nazis. And she's been interviewed, and um, and she was asked, "Why did you do this? You know, being a rescuer puts your own life and family at risk." Right. And she said, "She said I saw many sleepless nights ahead." if I didn't do it. Right. What a power. Yeah, that's a moment. Richard, sadly, we are coming close to an end, but I always ask our guests for a moment of great, a story about grace. You have one you wish to share with us. So. Oh, sure. Thank you for that. I, I mentioned earlier about my family and, and the rupture in it uh, when I became a, a conscientious objector. And that my grace story is that um, eight years later, after all this trauma in my life, um, I returned home. Uh, I reconciled with my parents. Um, I realized they'd always loved me. Mm -hmm. They welcomed me home, um, a prodigal son. I lived with them in their basement when I was 27 and 28 years old. <laughs> well, uh, that's fun. Uh, I, that's your punishment. <laughs> I got to, know, I got, but I got to know a mom and dad, and I had left the general and his wife. And so, the redemption I felt and the relationship I created by returning home really taught me uh, the power of grace. Great. What a beautiful story. Um, Richard, how can people find you and the Conscience Code? 
The Conscience Code is published by HarperCollins Leadership. It's available on Amazon, all the other places where you'd find trade books. Uh, they can learn more about me uh, by uh, just Googling G. Richard Shell, uh, S H E L L, G. Richard Shell.com. That's my personal website, or just Richard Shell and the Wharton School. They'll find me there too. Uh, and, uh, you know, eagerly looking forward to interacting with all your, uh, your viewers and listeners. Richard, you have been a fabulous guest. This is a powerful topic and so much in need today. So thank you. So. Thank you, John. Thank you very much for having me.